Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Jamie Harris as the guest for today's episode. We've long awaited this recording and we're so excited to be able to make it happen. Jamie has a history degree from Oxford University and a postgraduate certificate in education from Nottingham University. Dedicated to reducing animal suffering, he has volunteered for a variety of effective animal advocacy organizations, including Phonolytics, the Humane League, and the Good Food Institute. He is also working to grow the effective altruism movement by managing the local group Effective Animal Altruism London. Let's welcome Jamie to the stage. Let's jump right in. Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. I'm excited to have Jamie Harris as the guest for today's episode. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, great to be here. Jamie, so tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So I work at a number of places. One of the nonprofits that I work for is called Sentience Institute, and we do a bunch of different things. We're essentially a social science think tank researching technological and social change. And our focus is on technological and social change that encourages the expansion of humanity's moral circle. And so historically, a lot of our work has focused on things that benefit animals. And of course, a key and important part of that is these novel foods that are being developed that could replace animal products such as cultured meat and plant-based foods. And so we've done a kind of stream of research relating to those technologies and essentially ensuring that they are brought to market successfully, that they manage to displace animal products as far as possible, essentially. And so that looks like some tech adoption case studies that we've got on our website and also a few surveys and experiments relating to that. So I've been working there for about three years. I also work part-time at another nonprofit that I co-founded about two years ago called Animal Advocacy Careers. and we use the term animal advocacy to include animal product alternatives. So again, it links back in there. And again, we do a bunch of different things at Animal Advocacy Careers. We have some things like we have some online careers advice. We have a job board. We also work with animal advocacy organizations to help them connect to talented candidates for their roles and that sort of thing. But yeah, so we've got some work that may be of interest to listeners of this podcast as well. So we've got things like a skills profile about technical research for animal product alternatives. And we've done some research, which is on our blog, about the different sorts of job opportunities and where they're placed and some of the characteristics of them and that sort of thing, which we called our spot check research on this topic. I am a person who gets very excited about opportunities that crop up. So I tend to get <laughs> waylaid into doing various things on the side. So for instance, I've also co-founded a nonprofit called Cellular Agriculture UK, which I'm not hugely involved in with these days, but there's some great people taking that forwards. And that's like a local community building group connecting professionals and interested people in the area. So if you're based in the UK and interested in these sorts of topics, then yeah, that's a great one to look out for and sign up to the mailing list and that sort of thing. That's great. And we definitely see a lot of great content coming out of Cellular Agriculture UK. I wanted to step back and ask you, when did you first realize that you wanted to start working on these topics and really the topic of ending suffering? Yeah, there's kind of like multiple answers to that question I could give. One is the kind of like long term view of my personal emotional connection to the topic, which I think is a key part of it. Definitely like from a really young age, I guess I was aware of the suffering of animals and just really just horrified by killing animals, I think. Uh, and so I went vegetarian from a very young age. It was not something encouraged by my family per se or anything like that. Just something that I felt quite connected to. So that's kind of long been there for me personally. I was interested in various different ways of doing good in the world, though. And so this was not like something that I was necessarily convinced I'd end up focusing my career on. For instance, when I was at university, I landed on this idea of becoming a teacher as a way to do good in the world. The idea of being able to help people very directly, see the results of your work and that sort of thing. And so I did do that for a while. The kind of route back to helping animals and expanding humanity's moral circle in a kind of longer term sense was essentially through my increasing interest and engagement with the ideas associated with the effective altruism community, which is about working out how you can do as much good as possible. And it's kind of like a lot of effort going into prioritizing and research into that topic to work out how to help constructively. And then, of course, actually implementing and acting on those ideas as well. And so there's a substantial overlap between the effective altruism community and the animal advocacy community and the animal product alternatives community. Yeah, it was a kind of a route back in through that way for me. That's great. And I think that we can see that the EA movement has been growing quite a bit, but it's fairly 
kind of new, right? It's only been almost coming up on a decade now or so that we've been having a pretty strong presence of effective altruism and maybe when it was officialized. How have you seen EA has grown over the last couple of years? Certainly, it's a relatively new community. Obviously, various parts of the ideas have a more or less long precedent. Certainly, a lot of the kind of philosophical ideas have existed in various forms. And you'll see various precursors of the ideas going back a lot further. So you're right that I think the recent thing is more just some of those ideas cohering together and different groups coming together to actually organize for those changes. As for changes over the last few years, yeah, I mean, there's been a bunch of things, I suppose. In terms of the effective animal advocacy community and that kind of overlap there, Nothing jumps to mind in terms of like major surprising developments that have happened in the past couple of years. Certainly, of course, there are ongoing achievements within this space. If we're kind of on the topic of nonprofits that work to help animals and that sort of thing, there's always like this constant stream of animal welfare reforms that are being secured. And it's just hard not to be impressed by the great work that some of these nonprofits are doing. And if we think about animal product alternatives like cultured meat and so on, then you only have to look at the reports coming out of groups like the Good Food Institute to see just the amazing progress that's continually being done there and the increasing investment and products and so on that happening in that space. I think a, a nod to GFI is definitely in order because I think we have been seeing a lot of people that are mission-driven start companies for alternative proteins and whatnot, and that could be considered one evolution of everything that's happening there. Yeah, certainly. I think there's like a great kind of stream of entrepreneurship in the effective altruism community and its overlap with animal advocacy, both on the for-profit side and the non-profit side. And so on the for-profit side, for instance, I was quite excited to see the development of a group called Counterfactual Ventures, who are like a new kind of incubating program that have quite a focus on this, which products and technologies will have the most impact for animals, as well as the classic for-profit considerations. And then on the non-profit side, really excited about the work of groups like Charity Entrepreneurship, who actually played a yeah, a really instrumental role in the founding of Animal Advocacy Careers, where I work as well. Great. I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into animal advocacy careers. But first, it would be great to chat about the Sentience Institute. And so for those who are listening and might not be familiar, can you tell us a little bit about the Sentience Institute? Yeah, sure. As I mentioned before, I guess like historically, a lot of our work has focused on work relating to animal advocacy. And certainly that's been like the primary focus of a lot of my work. We tend to do a lot of reviews of external evidence that can be relevant for decision making in this space. So for instance, I've done literature reviews of things about health behavior research and what that might tell us about dietary change that interests us as people caring about animals, done reviews relating to public opinion change and so on. I'll just detail some of the work that's probably of most interest to listeners to this podcast interested in future food and so on. We have this stream of case studies about technological developments and innovation and how the industries have kind of built up around that and how that has gone. So we've got a case study of nuclear power, and this is focuses especially on France, and there's kind of a brief comparison to the United States there. There's another one on genetically modified foods, and more recently one on biofuels. And each of these case studies has a rich seam of different strategic implications for people interested in thinking about how we can bring new products to market and make them go successfully. So to take one example, the biofuels case study one aspect of that that I found really interesting was that it made me essentially more optimistic about seeking opportunities for business to business models rather than vertical integration and lab to consume models with cultured meat. And so an example of where this comes out is that essentially in the biofuels industry, we saw kind of stumbling blocks at one place in the supply chain that caused massive problems for multiple different companies because of their structure, essentially. So when oil dropped to $30 a barrel in the mid 2010s, many biofuels companies basically struggled to deal with that, whereas a more diffuse industry might have been more resilient. And so we see little things like that come out in individual case studies that are super interesting and inform our intuition about what sorts of opportunities are most promising. But we also occasionally see repeat findings across different case studies that start to stack up and give notably stronger evidence for particular strategic trade-offs that we might face as entrepreneurs and activists in this space. So for example, in multiple different case studies, we've got this thing where when you're faced with some kind of critique of the industry, and for instance, this might be safety concerns or something like that, there's this temptation to counter those concerns directly. But an alternative that seems more promising, at least according to the evidence from these case studies, might be just kind of like, rather than focusing on not that, basically continuing to focus on emphasizing the benefits of the technology. And so in the example of nuclear power, this came up where there was essentially one response to concerns about the safety of nuclear power 
was there was this report released by the US Atomic Energy Commission in 1957. And that was intended to basically show in detail how unlikely accidents were from nuclear power. But it backfired because people in the public and activists focused on some of the projected casualty numbers and drew those out and cut them out of context and that sort of thing. So by attempting to like rebut the concerns, it actually just fed interest in the topic. And we see kind of some similar lessons jumping out of the genetically modified foods report that we have. Yeah, there's that whole stream of research on the case studies, which I'd love for people listening to this to dig into if they're thinking about supporting companies, founding companies, working on a nonprofit side, whatever, however you contribute, I think there's going to be something useful in there for you. And I'll just briefly mention that we do do some surveys and experiments as well that relate to this topic. So for example, last year, I published a study that was basically testing how people responded to information about animal product alternatives. And so we tested like cultured meat and we tested highly meat-like plant-based foods and compared that to some kind of fairly irrelevant control articles to see how that affected people's attitudes towards animals. There's actually some kind of disappointing findings there in that people's opposition to animal farming seemed to actually go down a bit when they read these articles about high-tech animal product alternatives. And so that made me think kind of one upshot of this, I mean, there's lots of caveats that we go into detail, but one upshot of this is that like activists encouraging people to think about these topics, I'd actually be slightly more optimistic about them using traditional plant-based foods and some of these kind of slightly more kind of techie futuristic food types that are coming out if their goal is to encourage concern for animals. Certainly there are a bunch of other good reasons you might talk about high-tech animal product alternatives, like promoting investment in the companies and such. As an example of a survey that we've done, we have this kind of ongoing stream of research that we call the Animal Food and Technology Series. And we did our first one in 2017, but we've had some kind of more recent updates. We've actually got data collection ongoing at the moment about that as well. And this kind of measures a bunch of different things, including support for animal product alternatives and whether people think that people in society should use more or less of these products and that sort of thing. So I'm really excited to see the developments this year and see if we start to pick up any sorts of trends in how that's changing over time. That's fascinating. And so going back to that, the research concluded that when they are seeing high-tech foods or high-tech animal replacements, such as cultured meat, for example, then they were less likely to oppose animal agriculture. Is that right? Yes, yeah, exactly right. So this difference was significant. The thing to say about these sorts of controlled experiments like that is it's a really minor tweak in the wording. And the difference is really small in terms of the actual reported attitudes afterwards because it's optimizing for this kind of like controlled, what we call internal validity, where we can look at that and say, oh yeah, that is due to that tweak in the wording. So it's not very close to real world scenarios. So exactly how that translates into what sorts of promotional campaigns and such like that people should be doing is definitely up for discussion. Yeah, it's something to bear in mind that it's kind of like a concern that might come out of if we really pushed out the message in certain ways. But as I say, I think overall, because the promise of these technologies is so great for displacing animal product consumption, I still think we should certainly like at least selectively share positive news stories and such as and when that enables the other goals that we have. It just might not be that sharing that information is like the best way to actually persuade people to care more about helping animals or something like that. Yeah, and that makes sense. And I think there is this idea that if you're promoting cultured meat, you are promoting meat culture, normalizing the idea of eating meat in general. So that is fascinating. That's an interesting point you raised there as well. And certainly something that like, it's kind of like a plausible concern that I have in my mind. In that particular experiment, we also established psychological scale for speciesism more widely, and there was no significant effect on that. And similarly, we also measured, I might be misremembering this, but I think we measured something along the lines of meat eating justification. And there was no significant effect on that either, if I recall. So it's probably not having this like really wide ranging effect on how people think about those key underlying concepts. But again, this is a really controlled experiment. I still think there's like at least some non-negligible risk that it might kind of enshrine that sort of thing going forwards. I remain optimistic about these technologies because I think that essentially the more important effect would be displacing actual reliance on animals and the kind of societal incentives that we have around using animals and then denigrating our attitudes towards them. There's like a whole stream of psychological research on moral expansiveness, some of which touches quite specifically on this sort of thing. There's some great papers by people like Brock Bastian and Charlie Crimston where they've found really interesting things like certain types of animals that are associated with food use 
people tend to rate them as having lower mental capacities and warranting less moral concern than like very similar animals that aren't associated with food use. And there's some kind of experimental evidence for this sort of thing as well, like where people are given meat or given nuts as a snack in an experiment and their attitudes are tested afterwards, which all kind of makes me quite confident that if we remove society's reliance on animal products, then attitudes towards animals in general will improve, basically. It's a long run game, even if there are some kind of short term, slightly negative effects. That doesn't stop me being optimistic that these technologies have a really crucial role to play in enabling society to give animals their due, essentially, and consider their interests appropriately. I'd like to transition to animal advocacy careers. As a co-founder, when did you sit down and really think this is something that is needed? Interesting question. Because again, I could tell multiple different stories to answer that question. I guess one of them is that being quite engaged in the effective altruism community, one thing that the effective altruism community does excellently that other social movements that I've studied or have a general impression of don't seem to often do as well is these kind of community-wide or movement-level support mechanisms. And so there are a number of organizations doing excellent work in that space. And so for the effective altruism community at large, that includes groups like Center of Effective Altruism, 8,000 Hours, and in the kind of effective animal advocacy space, there's groups like Animal Charity Evaluators. And of course, Sentience Institute, where I work, do some work in this space. There's a bunch of others. I'm like missing a bunch of names. So the point is there's a variety of nonprofits offering support in that sense. But there was a bit of a gap, really, a gap in the support system that existed regarding careers advice and career services relating to helping animals. And this is partly because 8,000 Hours did do some work on that topic, but they narrowed their focus a little bit towards certain cause areas, primarily cause areas associated with reducing the risk that humanity goes extinct which animal advocacy maybe plays some very small indirect role in, but is not like one of the most direct ways to contribute to that. So they deprioritized that area of work, which left opportunities that we were excited to try filling with a new nonprofit, Animal Advocacy Careers. Another story is that charity entrepreneurship, who I mentioned before, they have this kind of program of research where they identify promising gaps in the nonprofit space, come up with a massive list of different topic ideas that could be really impactful to help animals. And they narrow them down and they do various different kind of research approaches to try and work out what seems most promising. And yeah, the general category of career services to help animal advocates and to help animals was one of their first top recommendations that they put out. And so my co-founder, Lauren, me went through their incubation program and was really excited about working on this as a result of that. And we were having ongoing discussions. I guess charity entrepreneurship thinking probably substantially overlaps with the thoughts that I've been having. But yeah, Lauren and I teamed up to essentially fill that gap in the space. I think that coming from a software and user experience design background, it can often be hard to kind of identify the why or even like, how do I get involved when you kind of approach some of these nonprofits? You want to make an impact, but sometimes it's hard. I think that animal advocacy careers does a very good job of saying like, this is how you can help directly. This is how you can join and help out. Was the UX of things a core part of putting everything together or anything like that? Yeah, it's interesting. Definitely, I know a lot of people who have said kind words about our work have come at it from this perspective of quite similarly to what I think you were just saying. As an individual, it's hard to know what to do. It's hard to find the opportunities that fit in and that sort of thing. And so certainly there's like a kind of category of work that we could do and that we do with our various kind of online careers advice and that sort of thing that is quite tailored to the individual thinking like, okay, how do I fit into this movement? Yes, certainly we have some content on our blog and we have a careers advice section. We also have a introductory online course, which is ongoing at the moment and we'll probably reopen applications soon, which are kind of tailored towards that aspect of coming at it from the kind of individual perspective. Where do I contribute? In fact, like a bunch of the different services we offer could be said to fit into that in some way. So we have a job board, which is obviously lots of people know how a job board works. But one kind of like slightly novel idea that we tried out is we have a skilled volunteering board, which I think is quite a nice idea in terms of, like you mentioned, really concrete opportunities to contribute and help out is where basically what we have is information about which sorts of support effective animal advocacy nonprofits are most seeking to help them achieve their goals. And so if you are, for instance, somebody who has got a software engineering background, you can click on our kind of like technical skills section, and then you'll see a breakdown of different sorts of skills in that category. And you'll see a list next to it of organizations that are seeking that kind of volunteering support. And yeah, so the motivation behind this particular service is thinking that volunteering is actually 
sometimes almost a drain on resources for nonprofits because it requires management. And if you're doing something fairly unskilled that anyone can do, it doesn't actually necessarily always help them that much. Whereas if you focus on this kind of like skilled volunteering where you're contributing something that is a particular strength of yours that you're an expert on that they may actually like not have a ton of expertise, especially if they're like a small or new organization or something like that, then you can contribute a lot and fill a gap that would be really hard for them to fill otherwise. And focusing on that kind of skilled volunteering also tends to have more positive benefits for you as an individual. Because for instance, if you're doubling down on your strengths, to one extent, you'll do the job better. So you'll get a better reputation with them and they might put in a good word for you and that sort of thing. And it's also probably going to be something that you're more likely to end up being interested in working directly in. So for instance, if you were, let's go with the software engineering example again, you might then test your fit with the nonprofit side of IT systems or something like that, where you can apply your skills in a way that nonprofits could benefit from. And yeah, you're more likely to be able to test how that would work with a particular skill set that you specialize in, basically, if you're using that kind of skilled volunteering process. Yeah, I haven't heard the term skilled volunteering before, but it just makes so much sense. You know, really, the categories that you have are on the Animal Advocacy Careers website under the skilled volunteering tab. They definitely make a lot of sense. I wanted to ask you, do you consider yourself an activist? No, I don't consider myself an activist. I consider myself as someone who supports the work of activists. So I tend to use the word advocacy. It feels a bit broader and it feels a bit less confrontational. I actually think that some quite confrontational activism can have its place in the movement, but I think there's plenty of other forms of advocacy that are less confrontational and valuable as well. So I use that term. And yeah, even then, do I consider myself an advocate? No, again, I think of myself as more someone providing facilitative services that enable advocates to do their thing well. Yeah, I think advocate is a, I don't want to say nicer term, but it is a more general, a broader term. And I guess I would consider myself an advocate, but not an activist as well. Whereas activist sounds like somebody's marching on the streets or, you know, ready to do something a little bit more than just advocate for a certain cause. The reason I ask that is because I think a lot of people, when they think the way to get involved is to kind of become an activist and maybe pick up that megaphone and be a little bit loud, but that's definitely not the case. And there are so many different ways that you can get involved as we see. Yeah, I completely agree with that comment on there being so many different kinds of ways that you can get involved. In fact, that's something that I try to emphasize quite a lot in a lot of our online content, partly because I think that I don't know if problem is the word, but one thing that might limit people from achieving their kind of maximum potential in terms of both like personal satisfaction with their career and also ability to help animals is just considering an insufficiently broad range of options. And so this is certainly something that happened in my case. Like I mentioned, I became a teacher partly just through lack of knowing about these different sorts of options. So it doesn't take long to kind of run through a list of the different sorts of work that can be done. Obviously, there's kind of nonprofit work, and that can include activism, but it can also include more behind the scenes things like operations roles, fundraising roles, and a super important one that nonprofits consistently tell us that they really struggle to get the excellent applicants for is those kind of senior leadership roles, being the person leading the nonprofit. That's not an activism role. You can see that there's just so many different types of work within nonprofits. But there's, of course, not just nonprofit work. There's also, as we've been discussing at various points, for-profit work, especially for like animal product alternatives. There's research work, and that can be in academia, it can be in nonprofits. There's also like another category that some people haven't thought very deeply about is the government and policy side of things and the political world. I often think of that as a more insider route to impact. You know, you're on the inside of the institutions that set down the policies that affect how people behave, how companies regulate their treatment of animals, what sort of funding exists for research, all those sorts of things. There's so many different levers that can be pulled on from within the establishment, essentially. And then, of course, you can also focus on encouraging those sorts of change from outside in more kind of lobbying roles and that sort of thing. And then one category that is often undervalued as a super important way to make progress for animals and indeed in like many other cause areas, of course, is actually donations. And so this could be something that you do on the side, like maybe you're developing skills so you can work directly in nonprofits or animal product alternatives companies later, and then you just donate on the side whilst you're building up skills. But it could also be something that some people have a real aptitude for earning lots of money and donating lots of money. And that could be a fantastic way to contribute. Certainly, like some careers and skill sets are just much better paid than others. And so actually going back to the software engineer example, some software engineers can earn huge amounts of money and they could potentially fund multiple salaries for people in nonprofits if they're able to donate that amount of money. So I do think that like donations are a fantastic way to contribute as well. 
although nonprofits struggle to get really high quality candidates for certain types of roles, especially like I mentioned, senior leadership is one that comes up a lot for us. They've actually reported to us that funding itself is more of a bottleneck for them. This is something that they struggle with even more than getting talented applicants in general. And so I do think that, yeah, if you can help address that bottleneck, give them the money that enables them to do good, then there's a fantastic amount of opportunities to do good there, basically. Definitely a lot of ways to get involved. As we begin to wrap up, I wanted to ask you about some of your next projects. So do you have any thoughts about what might be your kind of next bigger project, maybe write a book or maybe start something new, anything like that. And I guess broad topics. Yeah, lots of thoughts are popping into my mind. As I mentioned before, I'm quite an excitable person when thinking about different ways that we could contribute to this space, because again, there's just so many opportunities and so many gaps that are yet to be filled. I think one thing that I will mention is that at Animal FC Careers, one of the services that we haven't 100% committed to necessarily doing, but we're certainly exploring very seriously, is the idea of doing a kind of internship program to support people to kind of similar to the motivations I outlined for skilled volunteering, find spaces that they could be able to contribute to make a big impact in later in their career. And also, of course, on the nonprofit side, with being connected to highly promising candidates that could fill roles and gaps in their organizations. Yeah, it seems like a really exciting idea. It's not something that exists I mean, obviously, various organizations have internships, but what we would be doing would be more kind of like coordinating and taking on some of that process so that we can really get the word out, get lots of amazing applicants and connect them to really exciting opportunities to do good. So yeah, I'm really excited about exploring this opportunity, both from the perspective of being able to create those opportunities for candidates to explore different career paths and have a big impact. And yeah, also at that kind of movement level, really excited to be able to plug in some talented people to some gaps and some areas that can be difficult to fill with promising candidates. Excellent. Usually around this part of the episode, we ask, how can others get involved? But this entire episode (laughs) has been dedicated to that. Do you have any last insights to share with the audience? Yeah, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, as you mentioned, for the two organizations I work at. If you go to our website and you see the different services that interest you. In terms of animal advocacy careers, yeah, I think like some shout outs to people who listen to this podcast might be especially interested in. I mentioned those like case studies of technology adoption and those, if you want to dig into the details of those, that could be great. In terms of some of the kind of broader questions that we think about, if you're interested in animal advocacy things, we have a page on our website called the Foundational Questions in Effective Animal Advocacy, which kind of summarizes arguments for and against various key strategic trade-offs. So people could be interested in that. For animal advocacy careers, Well, firstly, sign up for our newsletter because we always have like new services we're trialing that we might announce. But in terms of the like animal product alternative stuff, yeah, I'd say on our blog, we have that spot check. And also I'd definitely give a shout out to the skills profile I wrote about technical research in animal product alternatives. I can imagine a bunch of listeners would benefit a lot from reading through some of those details there and thinking about some of the opportunities to test fit with the career path and that sort of thing. Excellent. And we will try to add some of those links into the show notes. Jamie, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. Yeah, thanks, Alex. It's been a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you on our next episode. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.